Welcome back to API Days Live Singapore 2021. In this track, we're going to continue with the, the financial services theme. The previous track we, uh, we was all about collaboration between fintechs and financial institutions. Uh, this track, it digs a, a bit deeper into the components of, of how we connect uh, commerce together. And we're going to start with um, a... Uh, a presentation from Olivia Bethier, uh, Bethier uh, from uh, from Moneythor. Uh, Olivia, welcome um, to API Days Singapore. I'm, I'm really looking forward to learning more about um, how we can uh, how our financial services can be personalised through uh, through through data. Thanks, John. Um, really glad to be here. It's been a great conference so far. Uh, great uh, day on health. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm going to try and share some experiences we've had in using APIs, obviously, and data, uh, but focusing on the digital and digital banking uh, use cases. So that interactions, which has become the primary interaction, uh, which banks are having with our customers, and and right. how oh, oh, uh, over to you, I, I'll i leave you to it. Thanks. All right. Thank you, John. So. Um, yeah, so I, I'm going to try and share some experiences in, of using APIs and data in order to enhance the engagement which um, customers have with, with their banks online. And I'm going to actually start, uh, try and share specific experiences on using uh, streaming APIs or the benefits of real-time uh, data and uh, even driven style architecture in order to really move experiences uh, to the next level. and. Uh, and really create much deeper engagement, much more stickiness in the relationship that financial institutions can have with their, with their customers online. Um, a few words about, about us um, first, um, and why we're, we think we're qualified to, to talk about this at Monitor. Um, we're, we're a fintech firm, uh, we're a software company, and uh, we, at, at our core, without technology, help financial institutions enhance the digital services they offer to their customers. So it's pretty much our core space. Uh, and we do this with a data-driven personalization engine. So all these uh, matters of leveraging data, being able to integrate fairly deeply within the bank's infrastructure as well, are things which uh, are our are, are daily uh, chores. Uh, we started in 2013, so we've been around for some time. So we've, we've seen a number of the waves of uh, moving from pure transactional online relationships to these new engaging services we have online, as well as new standards uh, such as open banking, which are dramatically changing the way services can be offered uh, in, in, in the financial services space. Um, we serve banks, issuers, and fintech firms. Um, we're headquartered in Singapore. Um, we're actually born and bred in Singapore. It's where our product center, our product team is based. Uh, but over the years, we followed the time zones of our clients. So we currently have team members uh, in addition to Singapore, in, in Paris, London, and Tokyo. Um, last but not least, very dear to our heart, um, we are, it's our holy trinity. We're self-funded, debt-free, and profitable as a company. It doesn't hurt. Um, on the right-hand side, some of the banks that we work with. So as you can see, our, our client base leans towards Asia Pacific, where we have uh, the greatest experience with large banks, smaller banks, digital bank upstarts. Typically, two types of projects. We, we've been exposed to the different ways to use API and data. Either we help a traditional bank enhance its existing digital service. Uh, the bank is already having an internet banking, mobile banking solution, wants to move it to the next level in terms of uh, uh, personalization. Or, and that's the second type of project, help a new entity, which could be a bank or could be a fintech firm or an insurance company or a conglomerate, launch a digital bank. Um, in the two cases, we come with our technology as an add-on to the infrastructure which is put in place to address uh, those various needs. So that's kind of the, the background for us, but um, the, the primary background uh, are the challenges which, and the pain points, which are part of uh, rolling out digital banking services these days. So we're really looking at those challenges here from both the perspective of the end user, so the customer, uh, which for us is both a consumer or an SME. We're not so much looking at large corporates, but more looking at individual and the small, uh, small medium enterprises. Um, 
we're looking at this from the perspective of those those customers and their pain points most of the times have to do with the limited value add they get from the financial services they receive online from the banks or issuers that they work with. Um, for a number of years now, if you look at all your mobile banking and internet banking, we have access to a fairly large number of transactional capabilities. Uh, we can look at our accounts, we can pay our bills, we can do fund transfer, but unless we're a private banking customer, there's very little value over and above the transactions that comes to us. Particularly very limited um, assistance to help us improve our financial wellness. While at the same time, with all the other services that we use, we have obviously greater digital expectations. So it's not necessarily a pain point. I mean, it could be improving your financial well-being, but it's certainly ranging in the expectations that customers have for what their banks are going to offer them online. Now we're looking at this also from a bank's perspective and um, two words really these days, how to increase digital engagement. Uh, as a bank, I want to create more stickiness in my digital services. Customers are not really coming to the branch anymore. Uh, we've, the, the, the physical interactions has practically disappeared. So everything has to happen online. And the challenge of creating a new relationship online is, is a significant challenge for a number of banks. How to make sure that customers are not going to use our internet banking, mobile banking once a month, but once a day. How can we be much more embedded into the, the daily lives of our customers in order to accompany them and have that constant online conversation with them. This, while competition has increased significantly over the past few years. Um, two primary reasons for the increase of competition that we're seeing. Number one is the new entrance, um, uh, either because the regulators have decided to issue new banking license to new bank, virtual bank, digital banks, um, or simply that they are more embedded finance capabilities in third party solution providers. So that's one, the arrival of those new players in the market. But the other one is open banking, which I've mentioned very briefly earlier, is the fact that the data uh, living playing field, level playing field has, has actually become much more open to any participant. Um, it's not possible anymore for a bank to hide behind its core banking systems and the fact that it's the only one having that particular customer data to deliver services. Potentially everyone can have access to the same data. So competition is increasing because now you really have to explore data and do something with it. Now, the additional layer on top of this, and it's really the core of what I want to focus on today, is the concept of real time. Um, the keyword real time has started to pop up in pretty much every single conversation, presentations that we've had with bankers, but also what is shared every time the new world of online financial services is, um, is uh, talked about. Two examples here, uh, Deloitte in one of their uh, recent reports on the, on the DNA of digital challenger banks, what really constitutes the core of a challenger bank, real time is one of the, the key characteristics. This ability to inform customers in a super timely manner about where their money goes, where they've transacted, the ability to perform their transaction in real time as well, and all that to create this kind of seamless, full integrated and personalized experience. Another example on the right hand side, and it's uh, literally a couple of days ago, um, this uh, interview from uh, Michael Mibach, the, the, the new CEO of uh, MasterCard, who uh, among a number of uh, uh, topics was covering what he is viewing as the key uh, trend, trends and the three concepts which are really at the core of the new way for participants to engage with their financial services. Um, crypto is one of them, open banking is one of them, the third one is real-time payments. So again, this notion of real times, which keeps coming back. So when we embed the concept of real-time banking experiences with this appetite customers have for more personalized, more value-add experiences, we, we get to a blend of a number of technologies um, and, and a blend of content being delivered across a broad set of services. Those technologies are real-time data analytics, um, using data in order to deliver this engaging content, but not only using data and fancy algorithms and interesting models, but using data blended with behavioral science techniques. Come back to this in a minute, but it is a, it has been a revelation for us that um, data on its own and however fluid it can be in a technical in, in architecture, thanks to all sorts of generations of APIs and technologies, it's very important to take the into consideration the way that data is going to be delivered to customers. 
So again, blending real-time data analytics and behavioral science. And the output is a concept which we see more and more being delivered by banks of insights, recommendations, and nudges. Those bite-sized little stories, conversation starter, value-add pieces of information, which are delivered to customers at the core of their primary journey with the banks. And these insights, recommendations, and, and nudges, they are generating engagement if they are delivering personalized content, if they are contextual, they are really part of the core journey of the core mission that the customer was trying to achieve, the primary job that they wanted to complete, and they're actionable. They're not just a raw notification. It might be real time, it might be in context, but it is very important to allow the customer to react to this. So the actionable element is particularly important in this, in this environment. A lot of data is used to do this. So it's also super important to be able to do this at scale. So the, the impact on the technical infrastructure are very significant. Um, it, is in, it is critical to leverage the right technologies and cloud computing is obviously one of them in order to deliver this kind of real-time experiences at scale. The typical use cases that we see being implemented are, are fairly broad. Um, and always one of our recommendations to financial institution is, is not to limit yourself to one particular type of story or content with customers. In a lot of conversation at the start, it's uh, very often around next best offers, contextual marketing, because this is the obvious ROI, because this is how banks traditionally have built business cases. It's certainly one of the source of content, but real-time banking experiences include a much broader set of conversations. Money management alerts and notifications. So the ability on a day-to-day -day basis to alert customers about any anomaly in their spend, in their income, any predictions of something which are coming, bills to pays, risk of overdraft, all those short-term alerts and notifications to help them manage their money better. Financial literacy is a significant one, particularly in our part of the world where we really have a mix between developed market and, and developing market, which have a large, largely unbanked population. So educational content, middle-term, long-term, food for thought messages are also important. Very interestingly, even if it's middle-term, long-term, food for thought messages, a lot of them can be triggered by real-time events. Next best offers, contextual marketing are also part of this. But again, that should not be the exclusive piece of content being delivered. And last but not least, all sorts of loyalty, gamified content. A lot of it has to do with merchant offers in our space. So really, the idea is to use real-time data, real-time architecture, and in order to deliver a broad set of experiences, stories, journeys, notifications to customers across this kind of broad content. So how do you deliver this? And that we need to look at this a little bit from a, from a technical standpoint. The traditional way integration was happening between a system of record or a core banking system or a card processing system. So really the core of the, the bank's infrastructure and the digital channels was already leveraging APIs, but was mostly leveraging client server architectures following a REST API style model. So as you can see illustrated here, the conversation or the system conversation starts from the client, start in this case from the digital channels. The customer is logging on to the mobile banking app. A request is sent to the core system to get their balance, their latest transactions. This is the response that comes back to the channel and it's nicely presented to the customer. The customer is moving to another page in a mobile banking app in order to do a fund transfer. This is again a request which is sent to execute that transactions in the core system and the response comes back. For transactional matters, obviously it's a request that comes from the front end, from the digital channels. But when it comes to information, this model means that it's only at the time when the customers come online that information is going to be refreshed. Which means that if something happened earlier, it's only at that time that this information is going to be leveraged to create personalization. So we've seen over the past few years, this model evolving, in some cases being replaced or blending with a streaming architecture or, in, or in an event driven architecture. In this case, it's not anymore a communication being initiated by the channel. It's actually the source of the event, the source of the super timely information about the changing situation of the customer 
producing that information and making it available to all the consumer within the architecture. There can be an, in an initial stage of subscribing to this set of events from the digital channels. But from this point onwards, it's in the responsibility of the systems of records, again, core banking systems, card processing system, to stream that information as and when required, typically as the transaction happens to the front end and to the digital core architecture to be acted upon. And it's at this stage, from those real-time events coming from the core system, that the information will be turned into personalization. Again, in a much more timely manner than the more traditional client-server architecture. There are additional technical benefits of the streaming architecture. Um, one of them is performance. If you want to simulate real-time integration from a REST API, it's also possible, but you need to constantly poll the backend. Hey, do you have new transactions for this customer? Hey, do you have new transactions for this customer? Hey, do you have new, et cetera, et cetera, every second, which is hammering the core systems with requests when there's actually nothing new to report. So the streaming architecture are, are allowing generally um, uh, the infrastructure to be more efficient in serving this content as an added benefit to providing real-time personalization capabilities. So what does it look like? Well, it varies obviously from one institution, institution to the next, but it allows to create this kind of much richer, but richer primarily because they are more timely experiences. A uh, customer will be able to see this, not the list of transactions that have been augmented two days after the fact, but at the time when that transaction took place, if they happen to visit. They might receive notifications at the same time that are going to be delivered as well. And on top of this, we can layer all sorts of additional features. In this case, you see the traditional personal finance management capabilities, setting budgets and goals, which can significantly be enhanced when the underlying transaction feed is real time. But frankly, the fun starts when we're really trying to use this to create an always on timely financial feed. And you see an example here where it's not anymore just about informing customers about their transactions, what they've spent in real time and uh, any money that has reached their account, for example, but it's turned this into a constant feed of value add information to actually help them improve their financial well-being. So all those insights, recommendations, and energies, they come as bite-sized contextual stories as and when required based on the customer's activity. Here is an example from um, um, Standard Chartered Bank. It's um, arguably one of the most uh, advanced examples we have for using real-time information in order to deliver augmented customer experiences. And you see here that entire journey. The trigger in this case is um, detecting that there might be a risk of duplicate transaction for the customer. I mean, all of you, all of us are doing sometimes two similar transactions at the same merchant during the day, and it's perfectly genuine. Sometimes there could be a risk of overcharge. Maybe the transaction has actually been submitted twice by the merchant. So it could be an error. In any case, we're not too sure. It's worth actually asking the customer, informing the customer in real time. So it all starts with a real time push. And this is again possible testing that condition risk of duplicate transactions, because behind the scene, there is this kind of streaming information coming from the core systems. The engine which sits between the core system and the front end is detecting this event, complex event processing, and is detecting that there's a reason to inform the customer. A push notification is immediately generated. When the customer is tapping on that push notification, automatically they're back to the primary mobile banking experience, where they see this information in context, immediately updated with the recent transactions that have been presented. So you see here that little card, that little teaser about something that the customer should pay attention to. When they tap on this particular card, if they want to zoom in and get more information, they get to a more full page display of information. The important part, in addition to the extra information which we can display here, it's the call to actions. The ability for the customer from that real-time event, which has been turned into a meaningful alert for them, something they should really pay attention to. It's been turned into an ability for them to react immediately. Call to action, and then we're moving to the traditional, in this particular case, service request. So you see an example here with um, an immediate notification for a risk of duplicate transactions. But the same principle can apply to other types of money management alerts. It can apply to financial literacy educations. Hey, did you know about this? You've just been charged that, that, that fee. 
Do you know that you could maybe take an action in order to avoid it? Give extra information immediately before you had the chance to waste some of your time to call the call center. Uh, the cross sell upsell is also one of the use cases where this can be delivered. And this is all made possible by obviously having some kind of recommendation engine in the middle fed with real time information coming from the core system. There are all, all sorts of additional use cases which can be powered by this concept um, with, in addition to what you've just seen with the example of uh, uh, real time complex event processing, such as uh, what I was showing we've implemented with standard chartered recently, it can also include self-service automation as well. And uh, even based self-service automation is putting all this in the hands of the customer. So as a customer, I want to actually program the way my account is going to be updated from real time event. As soon as my salary comes, if the balance of my account is above a certain amount, dynamically sweep the delta to something. So in this case, the call to action is immediate and fully embedded into the detections of the original event. We're seeing quite a lot of the banking experience that um, banks are implementing with a solution like ours, moving towards this concept of event-based, real-time self-service experience. Now, it's not always easy to implement all this, and we've learned some lessons along the way. Um, some lessons were learned the, the hard way. And um, I'm going to share here some of the, the key ones that, uh, that we see being, uh, being um, particularly important to take into account at the early stages of any such projects. And, uh, and more and more being important to take into account whenever, as a financial institution, you're looking at enhancing your your digital services and creating more personalizations. And um, I'm sure that, uh, John, you might have some, some comments and some specific questions on, on, on any of this. Th they're fairly technical, actually, for some of them. The first one here, and it's a word that I like because it's, um, it's a fancy word, is that idempotency is key. Um, idempotency is the fancy word to say that when you're sending the same information to a system several times, you should expect the same result. In this particular case, with event-driven architecture, for technical reasons, you might have to resubmit event. It's crucial not to create duplicates. Therefore, all the players and participants in an event-driven architecture, I mean, not necessarily all of them, but the majority of them should better be ready for idem potency. So something we've learned the hard way. A second one, which sounds a bit like an obvious one, but unfortunately, with a lot of banks these days, it's still not the case in their core architecture. One customer, in, particularly in consumer banking, is one physical person. It is very interesting if it's identified with a single identifier within the bank. If a single customer is identified with multiple identifier and you're starting to stream real-time events, it goes all over the place. It can create lots of funny, unexpected uh, experiences. Third one, which is kind of a corollary of the previous one, it's not because you're, you've invested a lot and set up a real-time architecture that you should not pay attention to your data. And real-time or not, garbage in, garbage out. So moving to a real-time event-based architecture doesn't mean that you should not validate the quality, the structure of your data. Timeliness is not an answer to everything. Yeah, so actually, uh, Olivia, um, when I see the, the garbage in, garbage out, um, comment i think actually we, we all we all understand data is not always high quality but then there are also biases and particularly when you start to use things like ai machine learning to to um try to anticipate uh, a customer need the um there, there may be some biases that, that that creep in so um particularly with uh, you know contextual um conversations yeah. so what are the what are the um, ways that you can overcome the the biases that may occur? Because marketers talk about marketing to a segment of one, but we're we're not there yet. We're not really uh, segmenting down to to the individual. What what marketers do is they identify a customer a customer persona. Uh, and it may be a combination of their demographics or their spending patterns. or And, and there's a certain group of people that we, we categorize as, as fitting that, that persona. And then they're going to 
be um, uh, classified according to that that algorithm, and then they're going to be um, provided with um, alerts or notifications or, or things that are based on that persona. But it, it may not fit them exactly. Um, what are the what are the ways of being able to firstly identify biases, but then um, I, I notice also you talk about event-based self-service experiences. Well, is it possible for customers to actually set their own preferences for, I mean, they can probably set their own preferences now for how they want to be communicated with via email or text message or, uh, or notification from uh, other, other types of, of applications. But about the types of things, can they set their own rules? Can they, can they yep. set decide um, if my if my bank balance goes below a thousand dollars I want an alert because I know that there are payments that come in and out of that that account um, can they um, or other other sorts of activities what do you see as the future of this self-service personalization yeah so t t your two questions the, the first one you know great questions on um, having explainable AI or even if we don't use the magic AI word, having explainable algorithm is key, probably across industries, but it's even more important in financial services um, because you're dealing with money and we, you're dealing with this, um, with a complex compliance and regulatory environment. So one of the things we've learned with all those, you know, bite-sized nudges and personalization elements, which might be based on some algorithm and machine learning behind the scene. One of the things we've learned is you should always deliver this, deliver them in full transparency and with full explainability. So if I'm alerting you that the risk of, that we think that there might be a risk of overdraft, we need to tell you why. So explaining that hey, you see that's because you have those recurring transactions coming up and your balance currently at this level. So for every single bite-sized piece of content we generate, we're always trying to find some explainable version of it that's going to make it a lot more acceptable for the end user as well. So that's the first point, which again is even more critical in financial services. Those things have to be explainable. An e-commerce player, an Amazon can get away with recommending products without necessarily explaining. It's much more important for us. The second question that you made is also a super important um, customer personalization. You know, th those, and, and, and in a self-service element here, all those things that you can see, they are decided by the customer. Right, but it doesn't only go into those self-service element. When the, the point I made earlier about the, the self the call to actions and the actionable content, the customers can take an action, but this action is not just the green button to do something. It's also providing their feedback on how they like this or not. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Do I want to see this more often, less often, never again? So in, in an engine like ours, one of the things that we had to embed very early was the ability for to collect customer feedback and to have the engine adapting along the way based on that ongoing customer information. So two very important points that we solve with explainability, okay. transparency, and um, actionable content and feedback loop for the customers. I, I, I like the way you use the term, the, the feedback loop, because this is, of course, a, um, it's used a lot, but it actually comes from engineering. Uh, uh, feed, uh, closed loop control systems, and I guess the the fact that you're you're looking at gathering feedback as as early as possible and as often as possible about individual actions, not only increases the transparency but also uh, improves the learning ability of the of the system because it, it, you really want to be tracking the customer preferences as much as possible, and what they set at the start of the relationship may not be what they need. Uh, two or three months or two or three years into the relationship. Yeah. Um, some of the other lessons learned here that could that could be relevant to, to our audience. Um, uh, number four here is um, something to be to, to be careful with. Um, you know, with all those real time even based architecture, we are moving to cloud technologies and it's all distributed and it's stateless and it scales very nicely. Definitely, you have all those benefits. But it comes with some additional complexity. And, and one of them is that the order in which information is received from the core system and consumed by the consumer 
is not necessarily the same order in which the producer was producing that content. Long story short, things can come in a funny way, in a funny order. It's very important to create your architectures to tackle, to tackle yeah. these, uh, these characteristics. So in, in event-driven terms, um, the, uh, the term uses uh, eventual consistency. That the, there may be different paths that an event takes through the, the network in order to arrive at its destination, but reassembling them in the right order is yeah. uh, is important from the from the standpoint of the context because sending uh, receiving an alert saying um, we, we cancelled the transaction uh, because of something is is useful if there was um, some context before that but if you get the context um, at another point well you, you could actually end up with the the wrong result for for the customer Definitely. I, I was gonna, going to ask you about the the event driven aspect of this uh, because their event-driven architectures are becoming much more popular, but they're also much more complex. And if you look at um, APIs generally, uh, external APIs in, in the world, probably, I, I'm guessing it's probably around 70% uh, of APIs that you see externally are REST silo APIs. And if you look at the, uh, um, the APIs that financial institutions have published, it's probably almost all uh, of external APIs uh, are REST-based. You, you get some uh, stock market prices and things like that that are that are more event-driven. But if you if uh, if you go to an, onto a bank developer portal uh, right now, pick a bank, um, almost all of the the publicly available APIs are going to be REST-based. Internally, they if they want to support this type of um, event event-driven architecture sets up a dynamic that's where their internal uh, their internal systems are different from their external externally facing or or is it starting to catch up I mean you, you I, I guess you, you when you work with a financial institution you work much more closely and it's um, more of a closed system but as they seek to partner with more organizations do you see um, events being, sent to, to yeah to yeah we we actually see the um, the event based architecture we start to see it more and more in the public developer portal and api gateways that banks are exposing generally in our experience it starts with web hooks into the customer transaction activity um and and sometimes it's actually because the bank doesn't want to be hammered by third-party application constantly asking if there is any new transactions available for a customer. Instead, they're asking through webhooks style pub sub, uh, publish and subscribe type architecture. They offer this additional method for the consumer to say, hey, you know, if there's anything happening for this customer, let me know. Um, still early days, but if you actually go to a number of banks portal and you search for webhook, you're actually starting to see uh, more and more. Now, um, generally, we start to see this in the public portal only sometime after it has been sold internally. The, the top priority for the bank is, is first and foremost to stream those events internally for its own benefits, but it's because it's important to validate this before you start exposing the same services outside. Um, on this front, actually, and it's the, the next lesson that I was, I was planning to share with you, um, there are out there a, num a new generation of core banking systems, right? They're, which tend to be intraday real time event based. And those are great because out of the box, they support this concept of intraday ledger, real time, up to date, even streaming, et cetera. But there's still a vast majority of banks out there relying on a 20, 25 year old core system. If we're lucky, it's uh, using a relational database and it's a client server application. If they're unlucky, it's an old AS400 core system. And usually a number of them thinks originally that they're doomed, that there's no way I will be able to provide um, any kind of real time. Actually, it's not that bad. Um, it doesn't work all the time, uh, but we've seen a number of real time experiences that could be powered even with an old crappy core banking systems by leveraging DB log events or just listening to changes at the core system level. And there are a number of technologies out there that can turn those change data captures into a streaming architecture. So the message here is, if you're a bank, you know you have an old core systems, you're modernizing it at the periphery, 
don't despair. It's actually possible to do some things in, with this in a number of cases. Um, the, the next one is actually a corollary. Uh, is because banks have traditionally had those core systems that could only process data once a day during the dreaded overnight batch. There is actually, even with the business team, a lot of um, overnight end of day batch mindset. And sometimes it's limiting their ability to imagine new experiences for customers. So what one of the things when we deploy our solution, what we always try to tell them is free yourself from your end of day overnight batch mindset, because that's when you will start realizing that you can do a lot more for your, for your customers. Those are actually probably technical, but there's a very final one I wanted to share with you uh, as a technologist um, is the fact that, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's all good to manipulate data, to provide those scalable real-time feeds and even explainable AI, but the tone of voice, the way the message is crafted to the customer, we've discovered it's absolutely key. So we recommend all financial institutions looking at enhancing its digital services to really increase internal knowledge around behavioral science. And I don't have any Amazon code to share, so I'm not going to make any money, but highly recommended book uh, in the top right corner here. Well, thanks, uh, thanks very much, Olivier, for those, uh, uh, for those insights and that perspective on how, uh, how, how we can make uh, banking more, more personalized. Uh, appreciate it. Thanks, Arjun.